Morning, everybody. Morning. I'm going to introduce to you, um, we have our presentation this morning, Plant-Based Medicines. Can Vermont and our farms be a leader? And this is a conversation uh, that's going to be taking place between Will Rapp, founder of Gardener Supply, and Jovial King, who is the CEO and create, founder CEO and creative director of Urban Moonshine Organic Herbal Apothecary. Uh, and what this session is about, you have it in your booklet, so just to briefly give you a taste, not many people with a medical need know where to begin when considering cultivating or sourcing their own supply of medicinal cannabis or other plant-based remedies. So this is quite an interesting conversation, especially given uh, what we've seen uh, in the legislature around this issue. So I'm going to turn things over to Jovial and Will. Thank you, Shanta. So welcome. Thank you for coming out on a Saturday morning. Um, we're going to spend about an hour and a half almost um, going over the possibility that there's an opportunity here in Vermont that is in fact is an extension of similar opportunities that have been emerging in Vermont for the last 30 years. So yesterday I was talking with Orly um, about this conference, Slow Living, and she mentioned to me that it grew out of a meeting with Woody Tash, who was the founder of Slow Money. Many of you may know of that. And essentially that grew out of a movement called Slow Food. So we have this, uh, these sort of movements, one of them being expressed here, um, that are all about, in fact, the process of relocalizing. Relocalizing and empowering us to be more in control of many things. Food, energy, health care, which is what we're going to talk about, economy. Um, and that point of view is sort of infused within the thinking we're going to have in this, in this process. Um, I want to read a quote from Andrew Weil, who some of you know of him. He's a medical doctor. But as an undergraduate, he was a botanist. And this is trying to frame what we are uh, aiming to talk about today. Uh, he says, human beings and plants have co-evolved for millions of years, so it makes sense that our complex bodies would be adapted to absorb needed beneficial compounds from whole complex plants and to ignore the rest. This is, this is an established fact in nutrition, but the West's sharp distinction between food and medicine somehow blinds us to these properties when it comes to botanicals. So we have eating and food over here, and we have medicine and um, healthcare over here. He goes on to say, the most successful medical philosophies in the world make no such distinction. So I'm going to tell you that it's only been 80 years that we've made this distinction. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And I think we're going to reemerge with this idea that there shouldn't be a distinction between plants and health and medicine. So my story on this area goes back to a conference that I developed and led in 1980 at Shelburne Farms. And that, the name of that conference was Bringing Our Food System Back Home. This was before people were much thinking about this sort of thing. And I went over to the Marlboro Center yesterday and I saw this thing called Sustain Sustainable Food Systems Masters and MBA. That didn't exist in 1980. The idea that there was a discipline and an approach and a curriculum to think about um, how our food system was perhaps unsustainable and we needed to move in a different direction. So that conference led me to scratch my head and say, gee, I'd like to be part of um, a world that um, was moving toward the kind of program and outcome that this kind of a uh, degree program offered. I didn't have a college to go to with that information, but what I ended up doing is starting Gardner Supply Company. And I started Gardner Supply Company um, in 1983, uh, partly as a recognition that if we want to relocalize our food, 
our food system, let's do it from the point of view of our own ability to produce food. So Gardner Supply was all about um, helping people deal with some of the challenges of growing food all year long. In Vermont, there's a bunch of those kind of challenges. A few years later, um, I started the Intervale Center. We moved the company to a place called the Intervale. How many know of the Intervale? Okay, so in Burlington. Um, and that became a nonprofit organization which was um, a stimulator or a catalyst for the emergence of enterprises, businesses that could become part of this wave. We were hoping it was a wave. At that point, it was barely a trickle. But we were hoping it would become part of a wave of relocalizing the food system. Um, and I then went on uh, to create an employee-owned aspect to the company. I sold the company to, the, to my employees five years ago. Um, and I thought I was retired, but it's not quite true. So one of the things I'm working on now is the relocalization of the healthcare system or the, or the medical system. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how to think about that from a, a macro standpoint in a minute. But that's what this is about, Green State Gardener, Grow Your Own Health Revolution. Um, and I'm a, a newbie at this. I, I'll tell you why some of the things, what some of the things are that got me to believe there's an opportunity here. But what I really want to do is uh, introduce Jovial's perspective on this because she's been at this for eight years? Eight years, um, figuring out, in fact, that there is an opportunity to create business that also fosters a relocalization of the healthcare system. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about Urban Moonshine and how it sort of got going. Great. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Let's see, is the sound okay? Or we can, we can one at a time? Great. Okay. Is that better? So I'm thrilled to be here, um, and this is my favorite topic, so I'm excited to um, get into it with you guys, and we're, we're happy to um, answer any questions. So feel free to raise your hand, and, and we can take the conversation where you'd like. Um, I grew up in northern Vermont in Bakersfield, Vermont. Um, I had a very radical um, upbringing of, that it consisted of geodesic dome houses and rainbow gatherings and lack of plumbing and composting toilets, and all th that's just the tip of the iceberg. So after many years of therapy, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a stable person, and um, I realized that the kind of challenge of uh, my childhood really gave me a lot of grit and a lot of um, creative problem-solving ability, which is a, happens to be a great um, skill set for an entrepreneur that needs to deal with challenges uh, every single day. So I really thrive as being the CEO and um, leader of Urban Moonshine. So I went from having no business experience um, to, and, but really so much passion for herbal medicine. And, um, and I had my kids really, you know, when I was quite young, and I moved, you know, back home, and I studied herbs with a lot of great teachers. Vermont has, a, you know, so many wonderful um, herbal teachers, so we're really blessed in that way. And I found myself being really empowered, especially as a young mom, when my kids got sick to just run out to the garden, you know, or, or open the cupboard and really, you know, find different remedies um, that I could use with them. And so I had a huge bookshelf of books and I would just, you know, bust out a few, read three different people's opinions on what was going on, see what I had available to me. And I, you know, my kids, I, I, we never had any situations um, you know, where I had to run to the doctor, you know, it was more like, can you just make sure that this is what I think it is, okay, I got it from there. Um, I'm a huge fan of antibiotics, I will absolutely use them at any time I need to, um, but I, we haven't needed to, you know, so I'm, I really respect um, Western medicine for what it is, it is absolutely fantastic, I mean, we have come a million miles, um, modern medicine offers us so many incredible tools, um, doctors are experts at disease and surgery and illness, and if I'm in a car accident, you know, bring me right to the emergency room. They happen to know very little 
about health and wellness and feeling really good um, and about lifestyle. And I think that they would, they would agree with that. And, and we see that the healthcare system is very, very broken because our, our amazing doctors are totally overwhelmed with people having a total loss of basic skills, basic home remedies. You know, I don't feel good. It's like run to the, run to the doctor. So when I was, you know, a young mom, I saw um, a lot of my friends that really didn't have this heritage. They didn't have this history um, or felt empowered to, you know, run out to their garden or into their cupboard. And their kids would get any little thing and it was boom, right up to the doctor's office for antibiotics. You know, like, you know, over and over and over again. And they were just in a bit of a panic whenever something went wrong. So I said, you know, I really want to share this uh, empowerment that I feel around my health, my kids' health, my family's health, and I was really inspired and motivated to launch Urban Moonshine. Um, so we're based in Burlington, Vermont. I have 18 um, employees now that work at the business. We're nationally distributed all over the country um, in Whole Foods and Sprouts, and our goal has always been to be a larger company. My goal is always to try to reach a lot of people. I always say that the hippies are fine, the herbalists are fine. It's really the mainstream people that need the help, you know, and we're all connected. There's no reason to say, screw the cities, screw the, you know, the mainstream folks. It's like, we're all in the same boat, you know, we're all in the Titanic together. Let's, let's figure this out. And the goal is to make herbs more accessible and to bring them to more people. Um, so one of my big part of my creation story was that I went to the farmer's market with my wares, you know, all my, my herbal things, and, um, you know, started talking to people. And I had really been in a bubble because I grew up in this really alternative way, and I um, just assumed everyone loved herbs, you know, as much as I did. And I, you know, after, you know, I was in, it was the Shelburne Farmer's Market, and so there was a lot of people from New York City, um, a lot of um, interesting combination of, of local people and, and visitors. And so I realized, you know, people are really frightened of herbs. There was so much like, is this a joke? Are you a witch doctor? I have to talk to my doctor. Is this going to kill me? You know, I was just, I was really saddened. I was really like, oh my God. I was like, no, this is dandelion. It's growing right over there. You know, I swear to God, it's, it's fine. So, you know, we weren't even using any really hard hitting herbs that you could potentially have issues with. We're talking elderberries and echinacea and ginger and cayenne. cayenne. And I was like, my God, we really lost our way in sort of what's become the melting pot of America. But a lot of other people that were either traveled a lot or were from Europe, I mean, there were so many beautiful stories of people's traditional um, knowledge of, oh, I'm from, you know, Romania, or I'm from France, or I'm from, um, you know, somewhere in South America. And they would tell me all these stories of their grandmother. There's a lot of stories and references to grandmothers. Uh, and I just found it to be beautiful. I enjoyed every one of those stories. Um, and I realized this next generation, you know, we kind of, uh, there, was, there was a lack of stories. There was a lack of reference point. And so I see a lot of parallels, which Will and I are going to talk about, between the ag move um, and the sort of, the, you know, the farm to table move. There's a really strong um, farm to medicine cabinet movement. And so we're excited to really be um, on the forefront of that and really pushing that conversation. And so my goal is to make herbal medicine more accessible to more people, less scary, more normal. Um, and yes, we want to, you know, sell lots of product in stores all over the country, but we also really want to empower people's, you know, um, you know, use of herbs, understanding, you know, grow your own garden. Um, and that's, I think, why Will and I are, great, are a great team, because I think his vision for really um, supplying people with the goods to grow their own medicinal gardens, you know, going beyond... Um, there's been, you know, the amazing food revolution. You know, people really are reading labels now in the grocery store aisle. They're taking the time. Um, that, and that's going to seep over to the supplement section. You know, people aren't going to enter the um, cosmetic area, too. You know, people aren't going to just, sit, you know, buy all organic brown rice and organic, you know, dairy and kale and then just, you know, n totally ignore their medicine cabinet or you know, what's under their sink or, you know, their bathroom cleaners. Um, it's all part of the same conversation. And so I really think that there is um, a lot of fuel for this movement right now, and there's a lot of opportunity. So we really want to discuss how Vermont can really pr play a role in that. And if you could go to the next slide. 
let me just um, offer, it, Jovial is this movement. Um, <laughs> she, she's, in terms of her experience, her commitment, her passion for it. But I want to also give you a, a perspective on why this movement exists and why this idea of relocalization is happening from the point of view of looking at the food system. So she mentioned farm to plate. Um, many of you probably are aware of that being the trigger mechanism from an organization standpoint of relocalizing the food movement in Vermont. But there was 20 years before that, there was an emergence of the component parts of that movement. And it comes from macro conditions. When I did the, co the, the conference in 1980, it, it was really building on the energy crisis of the 1970s. And we saw triple digit food inflation happen when all of a sudden the oil spigot was turned off in the 1970s. So people began to go, oh, do we really have a sustainable food system or not? In the, 19, in the 1980s, there began to be a recognition of the environmental devastation that industrial agriculture causes. Losing half of our topsoil, for example. The Alar scare, if you remember that in the, in the late 80s, where all of a sudden you couldn't eat apples because of these pesticides they were putting on them. So, so that's another macro uh, shift in, that happened in the 80s. In the 90s, it was really like the recognition that processed foods were killing us, right? Um, that the, the rate of heart disease and diabetes and other um, illnesses were not what Andrew Weil was talking about, which is food as medicine. It was really food as disability causer. Um, and then this last, since the turn of the century, it's really about climate change crisis. So you take all four of those crises and you realize that the industrialization and centralization of what happens in many of our economic sectors, food, energy, healthcare, the economy itself, are not really sustainable. Um, so I want to just, and so if you're interested in system, we're, we're going to try and do a micro-macro thing here. I'm talking the, the, the macro right now. And if you look at what the farm to plate movement can, discovered is what Danella, Dana Meadows, does everyone know Dana Meadows Sustainability Institute? Um, she, was, she was brilliant at understanding the levers that change systems. Um, and so what the, the farm to plate movement did is they said, let's try and understand those levers that can change our systems. And they found four key levers. Those were the regulatory environment, and we're going to talk more about that. Um, they were communicating clearly to the public. We need to talk, I mean, you just got a sense of jovial creating the reality of the dichotomy we have between modern medicine and alternative medicine. We have to, we have, to have the communications that under, help us understand that. Third one is the whole idea of technology, and I'm not talking about you know, high technology, I'm just talking about the technology that's appropriate to create the support for the system change. And then the final one is access or mobilizing capital. Those four things were discovered to be the key elements in the farm to plate movement to move Vermont forward, but the same analysis was applied to the energy system through a group called Energy Action Now in Vermont, changing its name after a while to Energy Action Network. They're trying to figure out how do we get to 90% renewable energy by 2050. Um, that, that system change used, discovered it's those same four levers that we need to work with. I'm, my hypothesis is it's the same four levers when we're talking about um, the, the healthcare system. S so those are the macro conditions, but there's also something, how many of you were here for Chico Lager yesterday? Um, what did he say about sales demand in terms of well, I'll tell you what he said. Um, in terms of essentially covering a lot of sins, right? If you have sales going like this, you can make a lot of mistakes. If you have sales like this or like this, it's a lot harder to find the capacity to learn fast enough. If you have sales going like this, you also can uh, have, have problems. So this idea of demand is really um, important, and I think it's important in terms of what we're talking about here because I want to know if I'm doing a business in this realm, what both the subjective and objective information is that says demand might grow. So when I left Gardner Supply, um, I, I started a monthly blog through Gardner Supply and I could write about anything I wanted to. So I've done 60 blog posts in um, the last five years. 
And three of the top five blog posts, in terms of traffic going to those posts and reading them, responding, whatever, um, were what's the berry that makes great wine and helps solve your cold and flu problems too? How many know that? Yep. Um, se se second one was what plant can you grow to cure, I didn't say cure, to cure high blood pressure? Flor de Jamaica, which is actually something you can't grow very well here, but it grows well in tropical areas, and I, I live part of the year in Costa Rica, so we grow a lot of Flor de Jamaica there. The third post was marijuana, from the closet to the garden. Those three posts were, were three of the top five traffic builders, and I looked at that and I said, huh, there's a, there's a pattern here of people being interested in accessing information about their well-being from a gardening point of view. Um, and then we're going to talk in the, more slides responding to this issue of, no, go back to that other one, sorry. Um, so the, there's an objective piece of information here about the macro health system, which we'll talk to a little bit. But this is just sort of the first stage of looking at the specific industry that Jovial is involved with. Okay. So in terms of the trend, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of good growth and demand for um, herbal products. It's a grow. It's been growing steadily since we've been involved with it. And I think that um, you know, you, you you know, if you look at the press, the press around, we 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 get a lot of great press at Urban Moonshine, um, and people are just you know they're curious, they're wondering, they want better options, and I think that there is a the you know that that switch is getting flipped, um, with a, a lot of people are not finding satisfaction at the doctor's office. They want you know I remember going to the doctor a while ago. And she's, you know, for a, a, just a general checkup, and, and she said, you know, anything going on? And I was like, no, I'm, you know, really healthy. I get, you know, occasional, you know, headaches. And she's like, well, I could offer you birth control pills. You know, and I was like, really? Like, that's your, that's all you got? <laughs> you know, that's the, the one thing? And she was like, yeah, that's all I got. I mean, that was, it was a really, you know, limited offering. And, of course, that's not all medical doctors, but it's a, a good portion of them. You know, the, the only options that they have are really, um, you know, are, are drugs, and I think we need more of a lifestyle. Um, you know, that's the thing about herbal medicine is it changes your lifestyle. You know, you take a pill and it, you just take a pill and it hopefully, you know, rearranges some things internally. But you, you know, need to brew tea. And, you know, it's like, I, you know, after, after school with my kids, you know, I put, you know, go out to the garden, I get some herbs, I brew some tea, we sit, we drink the tea, we, you know, play a board game. It's like, that's what changes um, people. I'm fascinated by the blue zones in the world. I don't know if you guys know about the blue zones, but there are these areas in the world that um, a lot of people are growing to much older ages than, than normal. Um, and so people go and they study them. There's one in Japan, there's one in Costa Rica, there's one in California, um, there's one in, in Italy. And they are going like, you know, what... Um, you know, what are these people doing differently? You know, they're trying to figure out, you know, is it something in the food or the water or the, you know, this or that. And um, when I talk about herbs, you know, being really about lifestyle, it's like, you know, they didn't go and they said, oh my God, they took echinacea for a week in 1975. You know, that must have been it. You know, that's why they're 105. You know, they're going, wow, they walked to their garden every day and harvested, you know, garlic and chives and oregano and then walked home and then cooked with it, you know, for 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. It's the little things that really make a big difference in outcome. And so we see our life expectancy in the U.S. actually going down uh, right now. It's a radical change. And a lot of the major health problems that are really overburdening our healthcare system are lifestyle problems. They cannot be fixed with drugs. Obesity cannot be fixed with drugs. It's about lifestyle. It's about the little things that you do every day. So I think we're, you know, everyone is aware that there's a major crisis going on, and we, I think we can use that moment and, and that opportunity um, and really um, 
you know, grow this, this market as people are really looking for more DIY options, um, looking for more options that empower um, them. So it's exciting to see more and more herb shops, you know, popping up all over the country. And so it has been a challenging regulatory, you know, environment, and we will get into that. And I think a little bit of the history behind that is that, um, you know, in Europe, um, herbs are highly regulated. There is no herb shops in Europe. People are always like, I was really floored the first time I went and I was looking for all the herbalists, you know, at the farmer's markets and all the little herb shops and they were gone um, because it had been so highly regulated um, because they respect it. So a lot of doctors prescribe herbs, you know, uh, all the time. It's very commonplace. Um, in, in the U.S., it's the wild, wild west. You know, they basically, you know, they kind of, they burned the witches. Everyone went underground. It was like this quiet thing if you used herbs. Um, and so it was never regulated. It was just kind of always um, this sort of home-based thing. So now that it's gaining tremendous popularity um, and it's becoming more mainstream, there's much more of movement to, to regulate it and kind of control it. And there's big money interests um, getting involved. So um, it's been great to see the, the, the building interest, and I really do think it's a, a great opportunity. Great. I want to go back just for a second to, you have these macro conditions that are making it positive. You have demand characteristics that are making it likely that businesses could find an opportunity to grow. Um, and you have to be careful about that because there's also regulatory frameworks, which we'll talk about in a second, that make it really challenging in this particular marketplace. But I want to talk a little bit of my own experience in this issue of growth and regulation. Um, Gardner Supply had been in existence for about seven years. Uh, it was 1990. Um, Earth Day 1990 happened. It was 20 years after the first Earth Day. And um, w we we had enough experience to understand what a projectable amount of demand was in any given year. We were a catalog company, so we mailed catalogs and we got response back. Um, and all of a sudden, as we were in February and March and April, moving up to Earth Day, our demand was growing by 10 and 15 and 20 percent, more than we expected. Um, and this was about Earth Day basically saying, gee, you should compost more and you should recycle more and you should grow your own food more. So there was this external circumstance that boosted demand. It was really um, a strong positive thing for our business, but had we assumed that was going to be a continuation, we could have gotten into real trouble. And I know that because um, seventh generation, you're probably familiar with that, was actually a business that started at Gardner Supply Company. And in 1990, it didn't have a 10 or 20 percent increase. It had a 60 or 80 percent increase because this, they were all about sort of environmental products. Um, so they made an assumption that that was the new reality. Um, that a year later, we hit the recession of 1991. All that demand collapsed. Point being, it's a lot better to have predictable, consistent demand as opposed to waves of, of demand that um, distract you from reality. But the other part of that same year was I was selling a couple of products and the EPA attacked me because they said I was selling pesticides without a license. Um, those products were citronella shavings to put in your drawers to take the moths away, and no, sort of cedar, cedar shavings, and citronella candles to deal with mosquitoes. So when I said um, a barrier to mosquitoes with citronella candles, apparently one of my competitors pointed to the FDA saying they are violating the law. So it took me $20,000 of pain and suffering. We also got Senator Leahy to change the law that allowed old time remedies that deal with pest control to not be regulated in the same way. That's the government regulatory framework that becomes really challenging. Um, and that's what I thought it would be good to give you a opening. <laughs> so that's a long story. I don't know how, how many of you read the um, the article about Urban Moonshine in Seven Days or in the Free Press in the last year. Okay, great. So people aren't really that informed with the what we've gone through with the FDA. So there's been we've dealt with major regulatory 
um, challenges with the FDA over the last year that have really affected our business. And I think we're, you know, coming through the other end, um, and I think we're going to make it. <laughs> but it's, it was it was dodgy there for a while. Um, so, like I was speaking about earlier, about Europe being very regulated and the U.S. not. So, um, herbalists and sort of this home remedy movement and the small herbal businesses, we're just they're just kind of we're radical kind of folks and. Um, and you know, it's a real, um, you know, it's, it's we, you know, it's not a common thing for us to think about, you know, regulations and big government and how that's going to um, affect, you know, the, our practices um, as herbalists. But it is really becoming very apparent that we all need to start thinking about it a lot more. So, in 2010, the good manufacturing practices, the CGMP practices or regulations, um, went into place for any size herbal business. Um, so before it was just the bigger, larger companies, you know, much, much larger companies that were regulated by the FDA, and um, and in, and they passed the law. You know, uh, I, I don't know all of the exact history, but you know, everyone knew that it was coming for quite a while. So people were aware that that things were going to really change dramatically. Um, and then in 2010, um, it, it came into action. And so I started Urban Moonshine, you know, a year or two before those regulations came into place. And, um, and I was aware that they were coming. And I was, you know, I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to give it a shot. A lot of people said, don't start your business because you're going to have to deal with the FDA and, it, and it's not going to be worth it. And I really, you know, this was really my, my love and passion. And I said, I'm just going to do it, see how it goes. If it doesn't go well, I'll just close down shop. So I launched the business, um, and it started, you know, going well. And I really loved it and enjoyed it. And we were finding good, um, good distribution, and we had good growth. Um, so you know, and so we registered with the FDA. Was what you have to do if you're producing herbal supplements at a facility. Um, and and so we got our first inspection. Um, I think it was in 2011. And it went okay. We were we would been trying really hard to have all our paperwork in line and have all of our documentation and um, you know identifying the herbs that were incoming in the door, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they kind of they they you know they wrote us up and they said change these you know these these t ten things. You know you need to have better records in this area. You need to have this area you know separated out. These these products separated out from these products, um, and so on and so forth. And so we continue to improve. Um, our compliance, and then we moved into a larger space, um, kept growing the business, and got another inspection, um, and that you know that came up with more issues, more things, um, and more things that they wanted us to do, and that resulted in a warning letter um, almost a year and a half ago that we received from them. So when you get a warning letter from the FDA, it's a really big deal. It's them. It's a public announcement saying. You have a serious, you know, problem, and you and you need to resolve this ASAP. So it really was um, a heartbreaking experience because it really showed the reality that you know we can no longer. I mean, you it is you, basically illegal now to make elderberry syrup and sell it at the farmers market. I mean, that is not an okay thing to do. You can't make any products in this country and say that it is good for you. Um, and make claims on it and sell it and put it into market. So that's a big surprise, it looks like, for a lot of you, but that, that is the facts on the ground right now. You have to have an immense amount of um, testing behind it. You know, it's really um, an, an immense amount of paperwork. Um, so it is really, really changed. It's changed quietly and, and slowly, um, but it is really going to change the face of herbalism um, in this country. And I think, you know, a good amount of it is due to free trade regs and that Europe is more stringent than we are, uh, and so is Canada. And so, but they don't have this amazing herbal movement that we have in the U.S., and we have, uh, you know, incredible freedom to practice and to sell things, and, and, and most of the world really envies that. And in a lot of countries, you just cannot sell herbs, you cannot um, bring them to market. You basically have to be a pharmacist in Europe, and you have to have everything uh, you know, pre-approved um, by, the, by the government to be able to bring something to market. So we're just undergoing that change right now um, in the U.S. So again, the changes were coming for a long time. I think they are sort of free trade um, inspired, but they're also big, big business inspired, big pharma and big supplement. And our FDA officer, you know, he's very nice. I mean, I don't 
like him that much, but he was nice. We had, you know, love and hate relationship, but um, he was like, it's no, it's no secret who wrote these regulations. I mean, he said that, you know, to, to us. He was like, it was the big supplement companies and it was the big drug companies that wanted to really um, kind of wipe out the, the smaller um, level of, of, um, of people doing business and really kind of stop the competition before it really started because they see that it is really starting. Um, I heard that Nestle or Nestle did buy a herb company in China recently in the last, I think, year or two. I was like, Nestle getting into herbs. You know, this is really, whoa. You know, these, they're, they're, they see that this is really, and there's a need. We have a seriously broken system. Um, and, and, you know, 80% of the world's population relies on herbal medicine as a main source of, um, of health care. And that's a World Health Organization statistic. Isn't that mind-blowing? 80% of the world relying on some so, form of herbal medicine. Joe, Joe, if I could just, you, you made two statements. I think the Western world is really constrained and restricted. Mm -hmm. The non-Western world, where herbs are really modern medicine or they are conventional medicine, we call them alternative medicine. So talk about that pressure point between most of the world is actually using whole plant medicines as their remedies versus us who are being increasingly constrained to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think that, that a lot of that is tradition. It is, you know, my experience at the farmer's market and people saying, you know, my grandmother gave me this or my aunt was the healer in the family or, you know, these are the, the home remedies. So I think there is, you know, you know, I was just in Jamaica and it's like, yeah, there's no difference. They cook food and they go out and they grab, you know, herbs and you're, they're brewing tea and there really isn't this separation. There's a really dark history of what happened to, to herbalists and to um, the women and the, and the healers in this country. I mean, it is really, really a dark dark history of what really happened when the medical industrial complex was built up and, and doctors and God <laughs> were knew the way and everyone else was, um, you know, in big trouble if you didn't kind of hide your, your ways. So really, um, it's, I think it's still in place. And so when I say herbal medicine, I mean, half a, it was really fascinating. I did a talk at the International Herbal Symposium um, at, to, uh, last year on on the business of herbal medicine. So I was like, oh, I want to make this great PowerPoint. And so I Googled herbalist and all these witches and warlocks came up. I was like, you know, thinking of some beautiful woman in her garden, you know, gathering things. And Google, you know, Google knows that Google's the global mind, right? I was like, this is what people think of herbs in this country, you know? All these like, you know, horribly, you know, warty, you know, really medieval looking um, people. So I was like, okay, this is, this is a, a lot of where the work has to be done. So opposed to it being kind of standard fare, you know, it's part of the, I mean, the, if you're an herbalist, it's like, it's like the main thing is like you, you cook with herbs. You add a lot of oregano. You're an herbalist if you add a lot of oregano and thyme and garlic and, you know, um, and, and you run out and gather elderberry or, you know, dig up some dandelion roots or eat some dandelion leaves in the spring. I mean, I consider you an herbalist if you do that. So when we're saying 80% of the world's population relies on herbal medicine, it's because they use it because they're in rural areas. Um, it's just what they know. It's their tradition. Um, and then it's also that doctors are prescribing it as a very normal way to go about things. Do you have a question? No, I do. Because I hear you using two phrases differently, and I think the regulatory world thinks about them very differently. You're saying, you, you know, you eat dandelion leaves in the spring, fine. And that's not herbal medicine. That's a traditional way of eating. Mm -hmm. If somebody is, is recommending uh, a tincture dandelion root because you have a problem, that's how I think of herbal medicine versus a nutritional diet that may be um, or hopefully, hopefully is rooted in uh, a traditional diet. I think it's very important to make that decision, uh, distinction because that's what the FDA is making. So let's just talk about that for a second. Let's just talk about that for a second. Um, um, I am married to a witch, but in the best sense, because she's always harvesting medicines and make, adding them to our diet. But she also harvests medicines and makes tinctures out of them. Right, so, so that we, ha we have both of those. But let's go back 100 years, or even 80 years, and you walk into a pharmacy. 
what do you find on the pharmacy shelves? You find largely herbal medicines, right? You find a lot of cannabis-based medicines, right? In the 1930s, you know, oh, penicillin, a magic drug. Let's synthesize that from that mold and figure out how we can do amazing things in, in terms of helping us. Fast forward 20 years, 1954. You have the Durham-Humphrey Act. I didn't know about this. Anyone know about the Durham-Humphrey Act? One person. Um, Humphrey was Hubert Humphrey. What was his profession before he became a congressman senator? Pharmacist. What was Durham? A pharmacist. So the act was essentially saying, oh, we're going to make some distinctions here. Some drugs are synthesized, and some drugs are whole plant. And the ones we want to bet on in terms of the pharmacy world are the synthesized ones. And we'll relegate the whole plant ones off to the side. So if you look at this number up there, 6.4 billion, today, 1 billion is distributed through mass merchants. Two and a half, two, over 2 billion is through health food stores, and three billion is direct to consumer. So essentially, this industry has been marginalized from the main distribution channel of this, this, this world, right? Um, and um, the, the one more thing I wanted to say about that was, um, oh, if you look at where a lot of our synthesized pharmaceutical-based medicines come from, right? Digitalis for the heart, metformin for um, diabetes, Axel for cancer, opiates for pain management, they're all plant-based. So a quarter of our core, our core medicines are plant-based. What Andrew Weil said here was, we've co-evolved for tens of thousands of years with plants. We know how to take that in. The body knows how to synthesize them themselves in terms of getting the value out of it. Pharmacies, the big pharmacists know, we'll tell you how to synthesize it and we'll monopolize that synthesizing process. So that's what we're, that's what we're faced with right now, is um, the reality that there are, and I think there's probably three points of view here. There's the the, the sort of pharmacy, FDA managed, the drug is allowed or not allowed by them. There's the world that you're in, which is more, um, you know, if, if you're going to make herbal claims, you've got to be really careful about it in terms of whole plant extract. And then there's the home market, which is, um, I'm hoping, and, and part of this presentation, Jovial is going to help you understand where the opportunities for growing medicines at home will be. Um, but, but I think we do have, we don't have a, a cohesive whole, just like we don't have a cohesive whole in the local food system where all the subsidies go to big agriculture and the, and the local sustainable food system has to struggle to compete on a fair ground with them. So, yeah. Yeah, um, is, is not, this may not be the right time. Is there a bright side at all to the fact that uh, it was a Nestle bought or, you know, herbal business in China, and therefore they're seeing the market, and therefore they're going to bring it to bring it to market in whatever form, without whatever patents in place. Is is there a bright side to that opening up, possible opening up of people's awareness? I don't. I mean, it all depends on how it how it goes how that happens, and it's hard to say. You know, in that case specifically, but I think you know it coming to the the. I mean. I was just about to talk about Donald Trump, but I'm not going to go there. You know, seeing the dark and the light and it all, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on from that. Um, so I'm not sure. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. But to respond to your question a little bit, I think that, you know, the, the, what we're trying to say is, is, you know, I think, you know, what we do, which is make herbal tinctures, is kind of like going and gathering the dandelion leaves. And instead of eating them, we put it in alcohol, we let it sit for three weeks, we pressed it, and then we, we sold it to the market as a really basic, um, you know, way to improve your health and your liver and your digestive system. So what I'm trying to say is that the FDA is now infringing on that basic level you know, the, 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 that herbalists are going to be endangered of being able to, you know, we, we make things. We don't, we're like chefs, but we work with herbs. You know, like what, what, what would happen if, if, if a cook could only talk about cooking? And, you know, they're a chef because they want to, like, get the best produce and then they want to, you know, labor in the kitchen for hours and hours and make this beautiful meal and then serve it to their family. You know, it's the act of, of, of making it, 
you know, creating that and that experience, that's what is, is beautiful about being a chef and, and cooking for your family. So as herbalists, we don't just talk about herbs. We want to go gather the elderberries and we want to make a big thing of elderberry syrup. And then we want to go to the farmer's market and we want to say, hey, this is great for colds and flus. What you're saying is you, you can't, you were doing that. It's harder to do that, and it's going to be harder for any new business that tries to do that to do that. Yeah. So I just wanted to respond to this question for a second. Um, I, do, I wasn't here Thursday night when the Schulichs did their new chapter story. Were you here? So I think there's an opportunity for a Procter & Gamble, which has high-quality consciousness, to take what new chapter had did and raise it to visibility in the world. I think that's probably a really, could be a really good thing. Um, the, going to China where there is no controls and quality oversight, there's no sense of doing it right, there's, there's only a sense of how to optimize growth, um, Nestle will have a real struggle, I think, so that they might be at a lower level in the quality in the marketplace. But when I went back and talked about those lever points, one of the key lever points is communicating clearly with the public about the value of whole plant medicines. And I suspect Procter & Gamble will do a really good job, or support New Chapter to do a really good job of that. So it, it could be a positive outcome. So just being aware of the regulatory environment, yeah? Just, you know what I think? I just, we better move on because we're going to we're we're try and do a bunch of questions Great. at the end. We want to try and get through our presentation. <clears throat> so regulatory environment. So the changes are, and why it was a huge blow to Urban Moonshine, was that you know, the FDA is questioning our ability to even identify herbal ingredients. And so that is a really big issue. So it's, you can't just say, I'm an herbalist, and so I gathered that dandelion, and I know it's dandelion. They're asking that we, you know, give them, you know, an analytical test saying, yes, that actually is dandelion. So we had a huge financial blow because we, you know, work with 60, 70 herbs, and we had to then not just say, yeah, we know that those are all what they are because we tasted them, we smelled them, we looked at them, and we trust, you know, the farmers that we're getting from them from or the distributor that we're getting them from. Um, we had to then go pay $300 per herb to make sure that it was what we thought it was. And so we had to pay that every time we got herbs in the door. So it really changed our business because maybe we were only buying $200 worth of herbs from that farmer and we had to pay $300 to get the test done to say that it is what we know. So that is really just fine for, for big pharmaceutical companies that get a whole freight load of herbs. It is not fine for small herbalists. So there is no difference now. Um, be for a small herbalist versus a larger pharmaceutical company, and the regs are really intensive. So we spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to get through this with lawyers and um, and a lot of analytical um, tests. So we're trying to get through the other side, and we're trying to see the light and trying to really blaze a path that other smaller companies can follow. So um, th this is really wetting your appetite for the que question about how can this benefit Vermont in just a second. But before I get there, if you go to the next slide. Um, this, this is a view of some years ago that there was the belief of a what's called personalized medicine. So as opposed to industrialized medicine, we're going to try, we're going to see a growth of um, a looking at the genetics and the molecular reality of an individual and trying to figure out how to support their health and well-being. The projection was a $230 billion personalized medicine. The, the the large out, outer ring, which is nutrition and wellness, is what we're talking about here. But it's the majority of this $230 billion uh, market. And the area that um, Jovial is working in is really more in the comp complementary and alternative medicine side over here. And again, it's hard to say it's alternative when 80% of the world's population, in fact, uses it. But that's our narrow point of view. And then the nutrition and organic care side. You see the growth happening in here in the food movement for sure and our hypothesis is you're going to see more of it in the um, medicine healthcare uh, world as well. Next slide. This goes back to that um, number you saw a minute ago of 6.4 billion dollars uh, in 2014 but the, the key thing here is the trend of the last 11 years where there's been a consistent growth uh, increase in this. I suspect also, Jovial, it was 2010 that they made that, FDA made that change, that that's going to force a challenge and slowdown 
into small companies, but it's going to accelerate for big companies to be involved in this. And in some ways, it's the Procter & Gamble's buying the new chapters um, that are going to be where this new growth is, is going to come from. What we're trying to say is there might be a Vermont expression of this now. So the next thing we're going to go on to is Jovial talking a little bit about what's happening in Vermont and how that might affect our farmers. So Urban Moonshine buys um, a lot of herbs from local farms, um, you know, in New England, but you know, especially Vermont. There's been a um, the Vermont Herb Growers Co-op just start was just started up by Jeff and Mel um, Zach Woods Herb Farm. They're just based outside of Morrisville, so really great and exciting m movement happening there. Um, so we are excited to really help support you know the local agricultural movement by buying herbs, encouraging more farmers to grow herbs. Um, and there's, you know, the cash, the, the value of herbs is oftentimes more than, um, than vegetables. I mean, it's, there's, they all have their own complexities. Um, there's no golden egg, but it's a really great way to diversify a farm um, and which I think is really important these days, especially with um, with climate change. So Jeff and Mel, you know, who were on that that second slide in the beginning, are dear friends of mine, um, and they have a great herb farm um, that we buy a huge amount of herbs from. And so they were inspired to seeing the demand to start this herb growers cooperative. So there's a number of farmers. Um, I think you know between I think around six to, to eight farmers in it this year. Um, and they are, so we put a big PO into them for a lot of different herbs, purchase order, into them, um, you know, saying, will you grow us all these herbs? And a lot of these farmers are growing herbs for the first time. Um, they're vegetable farmers, and they're like, yeah, we're going to grow elderberries, and sure, we'll grow some dandelion and some burdock and some yellow duck, and how about some lemon balm? And it's been, you know, really cool to see them kind of come to the table. And Jeff's story, you know, he's, I think, a third generation, who's a third generation dairy farmer, well, you know, had farming in his blood, but really wanted this next iteration. Um, and he wanted to be on the land, but he didn't want the, the, the life of a, of a dairy farmer. And so they started um, their herb farm based out of that. So I think that, um, you know, there's a, it's a really good option as we're trying to um, as diversify our farms more and more. And, you know, you, you grow, I don't know that much about farming. I grew up on a small kind of CSA farm, but I know, you know, you grow a lot of lettuce. You need to sell that lettuce, you know, pretty quickly um, to the, you know, the, your local market. And with herbs, you know, you can grow a cover crop of, um, of milky oats, you know, and, and harvest it. And you can grow nettles and continue to, you know, do two or three harvests from that, um, that crop. You, can, you know, you obviously have to set up drying sheds, which is a big, big process, and dry things properly. Um, dandelion roots, you know, they have fields and fields of dandelion force. We bought, I think, around $30,000 worth of dandelion from, from local farmers this past year. Just dandelion, you know, <laughs> you're like, what? You know, it grows, you know, in the cracks and crevices, but they actually have full um, fields planted, which is great for our pollinators. A lot of these weeds are the best um, herbs for, for pollinators. Um, which we know, we all know, are in trouble, and so it's a great way to support them. Next slide. So this is them um, bringing in the dandelion um, harvest from their their truck on their farm. Um, it was just great to watch, and there's you can't really see it, but there's their root washer um, right there in the corner. Next slide. So these are just some the top herbs that Urban Moonshine buys from local farms. So if you did have any interest in, in trying to get into that world, um, lots of burdock, dandelion, um, leaf and root, echinacea, um, elderflower, elderberry, um, angelica root, yellow dock root, motherwort, elecampane, uh, artichoke, red clover, and thyme. So these are based on a lot of our popular products. You know, our, our digestive bitters are our biggest seller, so that's where a lot of those roots are coming from. Um, and then elderberry and elderflower, there's a huge need for more elderberries. Um, we get them from a, a farm, mostly from a farm just over the border in Canada, and they can't keep up with the demand, and they're talking about, we were, they wanted us to go in on a whole freight load from Europe, you know, frozen elderberries from Europe. It's the only place that they can't get, there's not enough organic, certified organic elderberries. So people really trying to um, take advantage of that, there really is a need 
in the marketplace. And I think that now is a great time for Vermont farmers to get on board um, with that. So as we're growing, you know, we're growing at um, 30, 40, 50 percent um, on average every year. So our demand for herbs will grow at a similar rate. And yes, it's going to be a lot harder for those smaller herb companies to really get started and to join the marketplace. Um, but Urban Moonshine is growing, and I think that um, the, the interest and the drive to buy local um, herbs is also growing. Next slide. So really quickly, I won't... I won't um, spend much time on this, but I just, you know, put up a few of my favorite herbs from my home apothecary. Um, and so a lot of them are the other culinary herbs. You know, I always say it's like when I get sick, I'm, I run right to the grocery store. <laughs> I'm like, I need ginger, and I need garlic, and I need some cayenne, and <laughs> I need some, you know, some onions and some miso and get some honey. I mean, those are really my main, main recipes. And if that can't handle things, you know, then you have to go to the next level. But I'm a real kind of food, strong herb, you know, food-focused um, on herbalist. So that's, you know, the garlic and the sage um, and the thyme, you know, those are things you can always find in the health food store. And that's really, those are my, some of my top three um, herbs. And then we have the echinacea, elderberry, golden seal, all really great for immunity, building the immune system. Honey is just, you know, I, that's my main um, topical. I put it on absolutely everything, any scrapes or bumps or um, issues that my kids have. Um, we obviously want raw honey, really high quality raw honey. Um, so, and then chamomile, lemon balm, peppermint, milky oats, nettles, tulsi, you know, that's for, um, so the more emotional side of things or upset tummies, um, or, you know, building, um, up the blood. Um, you know, and I, and I think that it really speaks, those herbs especially speak to the need for herbal medicine. Cause it's like, you know, again, bring me to the doctor if I'm really ill or, um, you know, uh, very sick or I need a surgery or there's been some sort of emergency. But it's like, if I am sad and, and you know, unhappy and I can't sleep and I don't have any energy and I'm not inspired, you know, about life, bring me to the garden. You know, that's where I want to go. That's where I want to, um, you know, draw on my, you know, and build more vitality and, and wellness. And so those herbs really speak to that. And they're all super easy to grow. Um, a lot of the uh, um, herbs that aren't on here that I, that I was going to put on there are really the, the ones that are just, they're in your yard. They're not even in your garden. You know, plantain and um, cleavers and um, dandelion. And there's so many good things out there that you don't even need to plant. You just need to notice them. Um, so we have time for questions. Um, so we've talked a lot about this dichotomy between whole plant medicine and synthesized pharmaceutical-based medicine. Um, if Vermont is going to have a economic driver uh, in this world, it's probably not going to be from figuring out how to serve the, far the, the heavy pharmaceutical market. Um, it's going to probably be from figuring out how to build on the kind of work that Jovial and her farmers in her network are doing. Um, the biggest opportunity, the biggest herbal remedy we have in Vermont right now is in fact cannabis. Um, it's an underground economy. Um, the, the research that the legislature commissioned suggests it's a $200 million market in Vermont. Um, and uh, obviously, since it's, w what part of this is medicinal and what part of this is perhaps the other side, the, the left side of that list you had up there, the more emotional well-being kind of thing, cannabis seems to have value for both of those. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how to look at this emerging market, even as of this week, it may or may not be emerging in Vermont because of what the legislature is doing. Um, so next slide. This is, this is um, three or four, four data points um, in for the last 40 or 50 years of what people feel about the legalization of marijuana. Um, and if you'll see from 1969, adults overall said yes, 12% thought they should. Then 85, 23% thought, thought it should be legalized. Then 2000, 2001, 33%. And then 
and then last year, 58%. So you see the, the public, the attitude changing in public. And that's, a lot of that has to do with the understanding of the medicinal value. But remember I said if you went into a pharmacy 80 years ago, there would be, you know, 10, 10 or 20% of the shelves would be cannabis-related products, whole plant extracts for different things that cannabis can support. Well, we have not been able to research the value of cannabis as a medicine for the last 80 years since it became a prohibited Schedule One drug. So we don't know what cannabis can or can't do. My hypothesis is it's going to be discovered to be amazing, partly because of the discovery of the endocannabinoid system in the body as a receptor system for different kinds of um, responses to illness and, and wellness. Um, and that the cannabinoids, the 67 cannabinoids in cannabis, are triggers to help the body self-regulate itself. We don't know much about that, but we're going to learn a lot about that. The other thing I wanted to point to here is look at what's happening in the age group side of things. So last year, 35% of people my age and over um, were saying we'd like to uh, legalize. And how old you are? You're 33. Okay, so, and 71% of Jovial's uh, cohort is saying they think it should be legalized. It will be legalized. The trend is just absolutely it will be legalized. Next slide. So, in fact, in 2015, last year, there was $5.7 billion of cannabis sales. Now, that compares to the $6.4 billion of whole plant medicinal supplement sales that we looked at earlier. So cannabis almost is as big as that whole plant market right now. Um, but if you'll notice, the dark green is the, um, is the adult use uh, cannabis, which, which is four states plus Washington, D.C., has legalized adult use in various forms. 23 states have legalized medicinal use. So that's why you see the key growth trend as being the light green. Um, but you also see, as legalization increases going out to 2020, we're going to have a very big marketplace. Um, and what I'm going to bet is that Jovial and, and Urban Moonshine is going to discover that they can begin to use, well, when certain next legalization steps happen, they can begin to use uh, cannabis. In this case, this is an ointment CBD, not non-psychoactive part of cannabis, a CBD-infused ointment that's good for analgesic, swelling, kinds of things. Um, we haven't, this is made by a company in Massachusetts that's really a fairly sophisticated company about cannabinoid extraction and optimization and use and, and whatnot. Um, so we're going to see the emergence of an explosion, partly described by this, in terms of people's interest and demand in the marketplace um, growing. Next slide. So I'm sorry you may not be able to, to read this. This is actually research that I do. I did the first research last year with a National Harris survey. Um, and it, it, it asked the question, if cannabis were legal, would you grow it in your garden? Because I want to find the new tomato in terms of motivating people to garden. Um, and I don't know that, I'm not sure cannabis is the new tomato, but the signs are very interesting. What this chart says is that 50 percent, there's 247 million adults in America. 57% of those are gardeners, 43% of those are non-gardeners. The question we asked is, if cannabis was legal, would you grow it? Last year, the average yes I would for all adults in America was 11%. This year it was 18%. You know, is that a, are we going to see, we're not going to see that growth forever, but we're going to see the openingness of the open-mindedness of people saying, yeah, I could try growing that. Um, and then we're going to try and, then like tomatoes, we're going to say, well, what are the strains I should be growing to get the kind of flavor or outcome or whatever else that I'm looking for? Um, go, going further down here, what's interesting to me as, as someone who has been promoting gardening for 35 years is of the 43% of adults who are non-gardeners, 18% of those, I don't garden, but if I could grow cannabis, I would, 
18% or 19.1 million people would start growing cannabis if they could in their garden. So I like to call this the gateway drug to more gardening. Uh, so, so now what I, what I want to do is stop here and say how many of you are against cannabis legalization? Well, that's not at all what your legislature is driving toward. Next slide. Oh, there's one that's against it. No. <laughs> Legal. It's legal to grow hemp, which is the no, the low THC, which does provide the CBD. So, so let, let me talk. Let me talk. It's a good question. Uh, well, so I, I ha so I'm involved in this market in three ways. Um, well, yeah. Um, Gardner Supply has been selling products. Garden Supply has been selling products for people who grow cannabis for 35 years. It's, we haven't promoted it because we're, we can't promote it. There's actually the Cheech and Chong law. Um, Cheech and Chong got um, uh, attacked by the feds for selling bongs or something. I don't know. Um, so you have to be very careful about selling drug paraphernalia. I don't sell organic fertilizer as drug paraphernalia. Um, but some people use it to grow to grow cannabis. So in the one sense, I've been in the legal market of selling equipment to help people grow cannabis. And this business is expanding on that, focusing on millennials, because that's really what I want to do in terms of trigger the next demand growth in, in gardening. Um, then you have the medicinal marijuana, which there's four dispensaries, one here in Brattleboro, in Vermont, that have been authorized to do medicinal marijuana. There's 2,200 or something like that people who've got medicinal marijuana licenses. And the, th the third way I'm involved is through the um, Department of Agriculture Industrial Hemp Program. So there are almost 30 of us who have licenses to grow um, hemp. What is the definition of hemp? The definition of hemp is cannabis with a low THC content, below 0.3%. So we are growing now. So most of the hemp grown in Vermont has been for fiber or food grade oils. We're now, a couple of us I think are growing for um, CBD oil production. But, but that's, it's a gray area. You can't take that across state lines. You can grow it within Vermont. You could use it within Vermont. I hope I can come up with a really high quality oil and offer it for sale to Jovial. I don't know if you can buy it in the fall. Um, but, so I'm, I'm exploring this world. What I wanted to talk about in the, in the last couple of minutes before we have questions is what's going on in Vermont legislature. So um, the Senate Bill 241 was the passing of a tax regulate tax and regulate open uh, market for um, cannabis production, processing, and sale. Um, the House got the Senate 241 bill and has been um, massaging it, actually depleting it, um, for the last month. Um, where we are now is um, they, they essentially, the House Appropriations Committee um, passed, a, passed a bill onto the Ways and Means Committee, um, which basically said, well, maybe we should have a commission and maybe we should allow two plants to be grown uh, per person. So no legal commercial activity. The Ways and Means Committee depleted that and basically said, no, we don't think we should do either of those, at which point the Senate said, oh, we're passing a bill back to the House, which is a miscellaneous crime bill, and we're going to attach to it the Senate 241 bill, trying to bypass all the committees in the House. That's where we are as of yesterday. Um, and the outcome of that, I suspect, is going to be very little, but maybe we will do a commission to study yet again whether or not we should be doing this. I don't really... I'm not fundamentally against being cautious. I think it, there's some smartness to that. Um, but, but, but there's also the reality of that data that I showed you. So the other thing that this bill might authorize in Vermont is a non-binding referendum in November asking the population of Vermont what they think about legalization of cannabis. Well, this would be the X number of times we've done that, but this will be, this will be 
you know, a wide, this will be hundreds of thousands of people answering that question. So at least the legislature will have a clear understanding of what might happen, what, what, the, what the population thinks. Now, of the other four states that have legalized, they've all done it through citizens' initiative, right? So the citizens voted on it. They said, legislature, just do it. Don't negotiate it, just do it. We don't have a citizens' initiative, so we have to go through the legislative um, process. As of this week, Maine has authorized a citizen initiative for November, and Massachusetts is moving through the process of authorizing a citizens' initiative. And Quebec, you may, or Canada, you may know, is um, the new prime minister is moving toward legalization. So we're going to be surrounded by legalization. My, my conclusion about this is really, as it relates to this talk, there's going to be a lot of momentum for a, a new plant that's actually a very big market to be discovered as to how Vermont processors and um, Vermont farmers could use this plant for medicinal in the broadest description of medicinal well-being included um, points of view. So that's where we are. We have about 15 minutes if there are questions. I'm curious, Jovial, if the rules allow you to quote third parties about health benefits. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We have to wash any testimonials. Yeah, we have to clean them all up. And yeah, you can. more about like expert studies and stuff like that. No, no. So um, this, 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 um, I, before we started, I asked um, Jovi about Immune Zoom, which is one of her good products, and I said, doesn't Immune Zoom suggest you're making a claim? Yeah, so claims are complicated, and you basically, you can, you can um, and it, it's very odd, so you have to really understand the FDA website and kind of know how to research things, but um, you, can, you can make structure function claims, which are for a healthy body, for, to support the digestive system, to support the immune system, um, but you can't say that it will improve it and make it better and give you... Um, you know, or, or that you'll really be fixing or curing anything. So um, I was going to give an example. Um, so it's, it's odd, you know, for our digestive bitters, we can say that um, it supports occasional heartburn because the FDA believes that part of being a human is every once in a while you get heartburn. So as long, <laughs> you know, so you can say, like, we're coming out with a new formula for a uh, bitters formula that's great for the liver, and it's, um, it says supports cholesterol already within normal ranges. <laughs> and I was like, how are we going to fit that on the front of the bottle? You know, it's like the whole, the whole. So it's this really odd, you know, if it's normal and, you know, for stress and anxiety, it can be for occasional anxiety because they believe that as a human, we sometimes we get anxious. But if it is just, you know, anxiety al alone, it's considered a disease and you're making a claim. So you're, you're, you can say very, very, very little. Hi, this is James. Um, so while I see the, the benefit of, you know, this type of uh, business being able to go global and, and being able to impact lots of people across the globe, I have real concerns about companies like Procter & Gamble and Nestle getting involved and I'm curious, well, mostly because I think even long-term, past the Schulich's lifespan, frankly, um, maintaining any semblance of anything more important than the bottom line and the dividend to the shareholders um, concerns me. But it's sort of a two-part question. One is, do you have concerns that as these bigger corporations get into this business that there's going to be a watering down of that product? And second, um, what about the sort of long-term uh, ecological, environmental impacts when we have major, huge corporations taking on this, this industry? And what is that going to lead to? I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on, on that. Um, I mean, I think we were just talking about that in terms of medical marijuana or recreational marijuana, too. I mean, I have friends that are involved in the trade out west, and they're seeing, you know, big companies coming in and investing a ton of money, and it's already really changing it. And the environmental degradation that's happening just around 
outdoor growing operations and indoor growing operations, it's, it's, been, it's been really, really terrible. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I think that as an herbalist at heart, I'm like, grow your own garden, you know, <laughs> make your own medicine. That's really, to me, that would be the best um, outcome. And I think that if we can raise the awareness about certified organic, when it comes to buying herbs, I mean, it's mind-boggling to me that people are like so concerned about their, you know, organic kale, but then they go for a health and wellness product, and they don't care if it's organic or not. You know, we are like buy organic in the supplement section. My God, you know, here you are taking concentrated, you know, herbs and botanicals, and if they are just, you know, not uh, certified organic, that's a big. You're getting a lot of other concentrated <laughs> things in there too. So, so uh, a thought on that. Um, which is, in terms of the business Jovial is in and the FDA oversight, she's under an umbrella and shadow nationally. What's interesting about the cannabis world is it's illegal federally. It's only becoming legalized at the state level. Um, so Vermont has an opportunity to address those kind of questions at the state level, which is what we have been very, a group that I'm involved with has been very active lobbying for things like you should have sustainability cri criteria in the production, growing and, and processing of production. You should aim for zero carbon emissions. You, you, you should use renewable energy. As, as, in, as, um, as criteria for getting a permit to do this, because it's going to be the state that allows this permits to happen. But equally, you should have 51% ownership mandated within Vermont residents. You should have 51% plus um, of the capital being applied to this industry coming from Vermonters. So can you forever rebuff the corporatization of the world? No. But I do believe that the relocalization of food, energy, health care is also going to have include the relocalization of the economy, which this conference is partly about. And, and that's going to be about people recognizing the capacity of the future to be of their own determination and increasingly sustainable if we restrict what corporations are allowed to do. Um, and do I think this is going... I, I'm part of a group called the New Economy Coalition, which is 150 organizations nationally that... Um, that are asking the question, what kind of an economy do we want? So the Occupy movement did that, the 99% the movement did that, and now Bernie Sanders is doing that. Um, will any of that become a real movement that shifts the policy of you know, uh, international corporations uh, only if national policy forces them to do that? Is there an opportunity to do that? I think there is. Will it be slow? Yes. Will we get there fast enough? to make a dent in the collapse of ecosystems and climate change? I don't have any idea. But here in Vermont, we can do our thing. And what's interesting about the cannabis game is that it will be a Vermont context that allows legalization for the next three to five to seven years until the feds say, okay, we can't stop the momentum. Uh, we're gonna have to legalize. But in that time, can we create an industry that is powerful enough and distinctive enough to rebuff some of those external forces. And, you know, to me, Jovial and the farmers that are doing this within the current whole plant medicinal extract world is part of the, is part of the solution. And I, I think a major new wave of opportunity is going to be a smart cannabis legalization system. Um, <laughs> I wanted to um, ask a question about the uh, regulation. I, I'm sympathetic to the idea that, as you mentioned, that the um, $300, you know, $300 fee per batch is um, undoable for small-scale producers. But on the other hand, as a consumer, I really want there to be regulation, and I want to know what's in my product. And if I go to the store and buy a tincture, and they're asking a high price for it, I want to know that the herb is actually in there and how much is in there. So I really see the need for regulation. So I just wondered what you think, what kind of regulation would actually be appropriate for the small-scale producer and the small-scale farmer 
And one other question is just, um, I'm, a, I'm a grower of medicinal seedlings, and but I'm not certified organic. I'm organic under the less than $5,000 exemption. And I wondered if you buy from people like that or only certified organic. Great. Uh, that's an easier question to answer, so I'll answer it first. But um, we don't because we have to maintain our certified organic seal. So because we have to trace back to every farm, and they're organic, and that's how we gain our organic seal. So I completely agree with you that regulation is really important, and there is a lot of um, bad products out there, and that the, all the larger corporations should absolutely be regulated, and they should absolutely have to confirm identity of an herbal ingredient, so it doesn't, you know, or a botanical ingredient, so that it doesn't um, show up as something else, and you know, you get huge vats of white powder you know, shipped over from China, yeah, you need to do an, I, an ID test, absolutely. So the regulations in themselves are not bad. It is that they're affecting the very smallest um, range. And I'm still, I'm still toying with, we haven't actually found a solution that we think, you know, fits in a neat box that we can actually push forward and say, this is how we can do it. I think that, um, you know, encouraging people just grow their own herbs, make their own products, um, and that, you know, and that if you, I mean, it, it makes sense to me that if you buy something, if, you, if I buy dandelion from a farmer that grew it, I should be able to say, this is dandelion, and shouldn't have to get it tested. Um, you know, we'd have to do heavy metal testing, we have to do um, microbiological testing, um, again, but those are things that are going to be distributed to the public in a wide way, um, you know, and on the shelf for years. So it's not unreasonable at our size to have to do some of that. So I unfortunately don't have a specific solution, but I really think that we just need this protective bubble, of, 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 you know, with the smaller... I mean, it could be a, if you do under $100,000 worth of business, you don't need those same... Um, I mean, it, obviously, you know, small herbalists should t should definitely pay attention. You know, they should. It's not about not paying attention. It's not about not having lot numbers. I mean, that's a really good thing to do. It's not about trying to. You know, it, you should keep track of things. It's just good business practices. So the good business practices um, make a lot of sense. It's just the above and beyond um, that has no reference for batch size or, um, you know, yeah, lot size. So um, I'll. Get back to me in, a, in six months, and I can have a better answer for you. So before I ask my question, I'd just like to weigh in for James's question, which is um, I'm finding that on an individual level, there are a lot of people within the corporate world who are interested in helping people like Paul and Barbie at p and And I think the more of us who hold them accountable and work with them, we will be in a position to help them move into the new business paradigm. And I'm again making anyone a demon, but you know, they are us. Right? Um, and so I'm very optimistic, very optimistic about working with other humans, other humans like us within corporations and making a difference and helping them move in the direction that we know serves all of us. So I just wanted to, that's my experience and, and be my, per, my actually I have a personal question to you. Uh, it sounded like you were using honey like I use coconut oil and I just wanted to know if you felt one over the other were the pros and cons. Yeah, uh, um, I, honey I would use for wounds or bites, you know, so because it has a lot of um, um, you know properties to be able to kill off infection before it starts. So coconut oil oil I use more just as a you know topical good good for my skin but I don't know enough about coconut oil because it's it's not something that I feel like it's really come into vogue in the last bunch of years and so it's it's just now becoming more part of my um, kitchen cupboard so honey is my really go-to because I can always get it local from some local farms so I think they're used they're used differently and I would say honey is more powerful um, in terms of if I travel with honey so that if my, one of my kids gets you know a cut I'll I'll just cover it with um, with honey yeah Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, you mentioned going to a lot of, or a few sources of books um, for remedies. Do you have any recommendations just for personal use of getting started with a lot of what you've talked about? Yeah, Rosemary Gladstar is going to be the queen in terms of just basic, easy to understand um, herbal remedies and in herbal information. She's absolutely fantastic. Um, I mean, there's so many. Deb Soul. Um, is a great author. She's out of Maine. Um, Christopher Hobbs is fantastic. David Winston, um, 
all great authors and, and teachers of mine. Yeah. Um, I recall uh, reading some time ago about how many people, companies selling herbal remedies will intentionally use units on their labels that are confusing to consumers and not units that they're used to. My question to you is, if we're buying an herbal remedy, how can we be sure we're buying a product that has an effective dose? Because some of the units that companies use, if you actually did the conversion math, you'd find that the effective ingredient is far less below even 1%. Um, I would just say research the company and, and, and buy, you know, research a, a company, find a company you love and then trust what they do, would I, I, which is what I would say would be the, the easiest way to answer that question. And then you have to spend more. You know, if you're getting it super discounted for $9.99, you know, it's hard to say that it's going to be, you know, it, I, it, the higher price stuff, I hate to say it, it's going to have... Um, uh, better quality, not always, but I think really buying from a company you trust and doing good research on them, I think, is a is a great way to go um, about that, or making it yourself. So, so I, I just wanted to to the um, comment over here. Um, there, there are no bad people, but there can be bad companies um, that are that are part of a system that forces them to be bad. Um, my view. Um, and and we, we as consumers and stockholders can hold them to account. Um, but we need, to, we need to recognize that and move in that direction. But related to that, remember I said there was these four lever points in changing systems? One of them is mobilizing capital. Um, uh, the, the, the challenge is capital tends to flow to where the returns are, and returns are defined in financial terms. If we can understand there's a larger return set than just financial returns, um, like health of community or health of farms or health of you, um, that, is, that is a measurement that um, we ought to be interested in in terms of some of our wealth being invested in supporting those kinds of businesses and outcomes. Um, so people like, um, or, or companies like Urban Moonshine are going to need capital to grow. And that capital hopefully will be available in support of what it is that they want to be about in terms of the impact they want to have and the values that they hold. So again, you as consumers and you as investors um, can support that outcome to some degree and don't, don't um, diminish the value of that. Thank you.